All right, before we get started on today's lesson, uh, I, I, uh, when I got home from, from church last week, Amanda was listening to the, the Sunday School on, on YouTube, and uh, it's quite embarrassing to, to listen to yourself speak. Uh, but I, I heard something, and I'm like, did I say that? So I feel like I need to go back and, and clarify a point, okay? Uh, if you recall, we were talking about Jesus being judge. Right on the last day, we speak of that in the in, the, in our creed, the Nicene Creed, that He will uh, raise the dead and He will judge. And I said, Jesus knows who He died for. Okay, um, that's kind of a sloppy way to speak. I don't think I think as Lutherans we want to be very precise in how we talk about Christ, uh, most definitely in the natures of Christ, but also what Christ has come to do. So uh, I wanted to talk about, uh, just briefly, uh, two things. We have, we have what we call objective justification and subjective justification. Okay, And we're going to do a little flipping in our Bible here. But the point is, Jesus dies for every man's sins. Everyone. Jesus did not just die for the elect. He dies for everyone's sins. And we think of John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, okay? Uh, we're going to get into some text here, but that's the first thing I want to say. Uh, the way that I spoke of it earlier seems as if Jesus only dies for certain people. We don't believe that as Lutherans. There is a group, there is a religious body that does believe that. That's the Reformed. The, the L in Tulip, if you've ever heard of the, the kind of the anagram for uh, Reformed belief is Tulip and uh, stands for five different principles within the Reformed Church. The L is limited atonement. They believe Jesus only dies for the elect. He only sheds his blood for the elect. All the other people, too bad. So I want to make sure that, that we don't have any, uh, we don't think that, <laughs> okay? So I, I'm trying to make up for my, my sloppy speech. All right, so turn in to John 1.29. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, John the Baptist speaking here. It says, The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. 1 Timothy 2.16. We're going to be flipping around, I apologize, just quickly. 1 Timothy 2.6. It's after Thessalonians. 2.6. He gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So we have, uh, what we have is Jesus dies for everyone's sins, like I've said. We have, we have forgiveness won for everyone. His forgiveness is available to every person who has lived, who will live, who is living. So I want to make that very clear. So does that mean that everyone's saved then? If he dies for everyone's sins, is everyone saved then? Well, in order for forgiveness to be received, we must have faith. Okay? So, we, that's, that's, uh, so objectively, Jesus dies for everyone's sins. How that forgiveness is received is subjective for those that have faith, okay? So we want to, uh, 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 the, the same forgiveness as it is received, appropriated by and applied to the individual sinner through the God-given faith alone is how man is justified. That comes from, the, that comes from our, our Book of Concord, and that's sola fide, that's faith alone, okay? That's, that's the, the, uh, the avenue, if you will, of how we receive what Christ does on the cross, so we have objectively Christ dying for everyone's sins. Subjectively, it is applied to each one of us through faith. Okay? So the question is, where do we receive faith? Right there at the baptismal font. We receive faith. That's what God works in us. Um, we, have that, uh, uh, we have that connected with Matthew 28 when Jesus says, this is how you will make disciples. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We have faith coming through hearing. We have God's word attached to the water and giving faith, even to, even to babies. So the subjective rests on the objective, okay? Um, but, but I wanted to be very particular and, and make sure uh, I, didn't, I didn't lead anyone astray in how I said that. So it was uh, uh, a moment where I thought, nah, that's, that's just not the best way to say that. Okay? It's just not the best way to say that. So any questions on objective and subjectification or comments? No? All right, well, we'll continue on in our study um, of, uh, of Ephesians. We'll finish up this section and then uh, maybe get into a little bit more of the, uh, of the, <clears throat> the rest of the, the thing. If we, if we go off the notes that we can just keep on rolling, okay? All right. So we have, what we have here, just a reminder is, if you turn to the very back sheet again, we have the, 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 the commentaries translation, translation of this prayer that Paul is giving to the Ephesian, the, the Ephesian church, okay? So he's, he's uh, uh, we, we talked about how this would have been used in a liturgical setting, that Paul is using this letter as, in a sense, a sermon to his, uh, to his people, to his church, and he opens up with a prayer. And so we have that translation, and that's something you can kind of refer back to. And wh- where we left off last week is talking about the elect. Uh, there on verse 3 and 4 of the second page. Excuse me. So we have, uh, we have basically talking about uh, the baptized who are holy and blameless before Christ. So I'm going to read, uh, read quickly uh, the, the, the prayer, just so we have a context, a broader context of, of what uh, Paul is talking about. Starting at verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus, who, was bl- who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood and forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Thus ends Paul's opening prayer to the, to the Ephesians. So we noted that the, the, a characteristic of this prayer, he's not asking for anything. There's no petition in there. It's, it's simply uh, praising God for who he is and what he has done for us. Um, we noted too the, the underlining on the, on the translation that it's all about Jesus in Christ, in whom, uh, in him. That, uh, that the, the, the source of our salvation uh, is in Christ alone. Uh, another sole of the Reformation, sole Christus, that, that it is Christ alone who saves us. It is his work. We talked about monergism last week. That it is God's work for us in salvation. We don't play any role in that. Okay? Um, so, there in verse 4, he talks about us being holy and blameless, uh, in our translation, uh, without, holy and without blame before him in love. So, uh, so the baptized are holy and blameless before Christ. The church is the spotless bride of Christ. Uh, the, the Bible very 
uh, explicitly speaks of us as being his bride. Um, a pure bride clothed in white. And we know that we are not pure by nature. We are sinners. We have no business wearing this white, uh, like a white gown uh, of the bride. But we are washed white as snow, cleansed of our sins in Christ Jesus. So we can, we can be spotless, uh, holy, and blameless uh, before, before Christ. So turn to uh, the very uh, end of Ephesians 5.27. Paul, uh, this whole section here, uh, marriage, Christ, and the church, uh, 5.22 to 33, um, which we'll eventually get to. Uh, but uh, it, it's, uh, this, is, this helps us form kind of what Paul's talking about and where he's going. 527, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So Paul is going to continue to, to drive on this. That you, yes, you are sinners, but you are forgiven sinners. You have been washed in Christ, the prominent theme, in Christ, that, it, that his blood has washed over you in your baptism, and you are forgiven. So, I have in our notes, only God has the authority of judgment to declare us righteous. Only God can do that. The, the inheritance that we have, uh, that we're going to get to where we're, taught, where we're spoken of as uh, adopted sons, that we are brought in to, to God's family in baptism, that we now have the inheritance, that we have been, been declared righteous, that we, are, um, that we are in the eyes of God exactly what Christ was. Perfect, sinless, spotless, without blemish. Uh, and it's only God's authority. God is God. It is, it is his authority that, that says that. So we don't have to worry about any higher authority over God saying, no, 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 I'm vetoing that declaration. No, it comes from the highest authority, God, the creator, God who became man and died for us. So we, have, uh, we always want to point to that, and that's for our assurance that we, that we know this, that it is God's authority that, um, that we are declared righteous. All right, so... Um, uh, uh, I have here Zechariah's prophecy in Luke 1. Um, if you, this is going to sound very familiar uh, if you turn to Luke 1. This is actually part of our liturgy. Uh, we, uh, this is one of the verses that we, uh, we sing together during Matins. We have Zechariah, just for context. Uh, Zechariah in, uh, what did I say, uh, verses 74 and 75 uh, but the, the Zacharias prophecy is actually a larger section. Um, but, we, but we sing this during Matins. This is uh, called the um, Benedictus, I believe. I don't think I have it on here. But this is important, that, uh, that, that Zacharias uh, embodies the anticipation of the Savior. And as Jesus is being presented at the temple... He recognizes this is the Messiah, the long-awaited Messiah that, that he has the, the good pleasure of seeing with his eyes the Savior of the world. And this is what Zechariah has to say in 74. To grant us that we, being delivered from the hand of our enemies, might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all the days of our life. And I'll just continue on. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the face of of the Lord to prepare his way, to give knowledge of salvation to his people. So we have uh, the, 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 the declaration that, that it is Jesus who makes us holy uh, and righteous uh, before God because of what he does for us. So Jesus is our salvation and our deliverer. Uh, through his righteousness and holiness, we can stand before God. Because that is a heavy thing, right? To, to stand before a holy God. You know, that's a... That's a uh, but we don't have to fear. Uh, the devil would wish to make us think, well, you don't want to be before God. You're a sinner. You know, you can't stand in the holiness of, of God Almighty. But we can because of Jesus Christ and what he has given to us. We have no fear that, that we will be seen as Christ. Uh, 
perfect and sinless. All right, so any questions on that as we wrap up that the brief little section? All right, moving along. Okay, verses uh, 5 and 6, we have, Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the Beloved. So we are adopted sons of the Father. And think of this in the context of the Ephesian church. Uh, they are Gentiles. They are not Jews. Okay? They were not part of, of the historic family of God. And so this has, a, uh, this, this has a little extra punch to it that they are adopted in the sense of they are being brought in to God's family, these, these Gentiles. Um, and, and once again, we'll talk about how this plays a prominent role in, in Paul's theology. That, uh, that Jew and Gentile are, are now unified in Christ. There's no longer division or distinction. Uh, so this is, uh, these are very comforting words for these Ephesians, that they are adopted sons of the Father. Uh, one can only be a son of God if they are in Christ. That's what he says there. Uh, sons by Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ to himself. That we have to be in Christ to be sons of God. So we're going to spend a little bit of uh, time in John here. Um, so I think this is important. Um, at, uh, at Emmanuel, we're doing a, a, a gospel study on John, and it's, it's beautiful because it really allows me to, to spend some time in John. But John is just a, a beautiful gospel that, that is so uh, comforting to our, to our conscience. Um, but if you turn to John, our first one there is John 10. And we want to think of, uh, keeping that in the back of our brain, that we are in Christ. That's how we are adopted, that it is through Jesus Christ. So John 10, 6 says this. <clears throat> I'm sorry, 10, 9. He says, I am the door. Jesus using the, the I am. Jesus declaring himself as God. This is... He's, this is uh, intentional, that he's saying, I am. You know, how, how did God reveal himself to Moses? He said, I am. Okay? So Jesus is, is, is confessing his divinity, but he says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. This is the, uh, the good shepherd section, that Jesus is the good shepherd, that, uh, that he, uh, he watches over his sheep. He, he, he takes care of them, but, but you... Uh, he is the door which uh, you must enter through him um, to, to be saved. That we have a, um, that Christ alone, once again, this, this Christ alone, that it is Jesus Christ uh, in whom only we are saved. John 14, 6. A couple pages over. Playing on the theme of one can only be a son of God if they are in Christ. John 14, 6. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That we have, once again, uh, Jesus uh, affirming that it is through him only. Paul, uh, in, uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit, delivering the doctrine of truth for us, uh, continues to, uh, to amplify uh, what God has to reveal, that it is in Christ alone. And the last one we'll do is John 1, the very beginning, the very prologue. Uh, it tells us um, who can be a son of God, who can be a child of God. 1, 12 through 13. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And immediately we're thinking, well, how are we to be born of God? Where are we born of God? In John, it's revealed to us, Jesus tells Nicodemus in, the very, in chapter 3, that you must be born from above. Be born again. Nicodemus says, how am I to be born again? He says, through water and word, through baptism. That's how we are born as God's children. So it's, uh, 
I know I'm, I'm continuing to harp on it, but it's, it's, uh, it's very important that we understand um, where the source of our salvation is in Christ alone, how we are made God's children, because these are the things that we deal with each and every day when we are attacked by Satan's fiery darts that wishes to make us doubt that we are good enough for God, that we've done enough for God. You know, even the, even the strongest in faith can struggle with doubt, can have uh, their conscience be troubled. And, and God gives us his word to ease our conscience so that there is no doubt. Yes? Okay, John 10 you're talking about? Okay, so uh, let me read, let me get uh, context here. So let's, let's start at verse 7. Uh, we could most certainly start at 1, but we always want to have context. There's three rules for, for, uh, for reading the Bible, right, and hearing passages. Three rules are context, context, and context. We want to make sure we have context on what we're, on what we're reading. So we'll start 10.1. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear me. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to, to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for his sheep. And he who is a hireling and not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. So I think it's enough context. So at the end of 9, it says, and will, uh, if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Um, immediately what I'm thinking of is um, Proverbs 23, or not Proverbs, Psalm 23, uh, where we have the Lord is our shepherd, we shall not want, that, that we have the, uh, the going in and out. Uh, we don't want to get the idea that it's uh, you're in and out of faith or you're in and out of Christ. Uh, that the shepherd is always watching and he's always leading. And, uh, and I, I believe, uh, if I'm, I'm up to speed on my first century shepherding practices, uh, that they would, they would go and, and sleep in a protected area at night and then go out during the day. And, he, and how would the shepherd lead the sheep? Through his voice. And he'd have his staff, you know, to, to fight the wolves. And uh, so... Um, if, if I understand it correctly, it's talking that through all things, God is with them as their shepherd and leading them. Uh, and, and to think back on, on Psalm 23, that, that we have this connection with, with Christ as our shepherd, even through, even through the valley of the shadow of death, he is with us and he leads us and he prepares for us uh, a feast, if you will. So does that answer your question? Yeah? Another one? No? All right, great question. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, we were talking about uh, baptism in John 3. Uh, to be in Christ is to be, uh, to be the children of God. Um, it is the Father's will that we be saved through the Son. So, while we're still in John, turn to, to John, si John 6. We've got uh, 38 through 40 there. Uh, once again... Beautiful discourse, beautiful, uh, yeah, just read John. Just make that a, a commitment to, to do weekly. It's, it's great. So I, I have 38 through 40 here, and this is, once again, part, a narrow part of a broader context. Um, 
But 38, it says, For I have come uh, down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. That it is the Father's will that we be saved through the Son. Uh, continuing on, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life and I will raise him up at the last day. <clears throat> so uh, once again, we have uh, uh, very strong words of comfort. This is gospel. Uh, that, that, that what does he say? Uh, what God the Father has given me, I should lose nothing. That, that, uh, that it's not like a, a, a forgetful father that's, you know, leaves a kid behind at the store. Or, you know, we've all had these these moments, or at least nightmares as parents, where you're like, did I forget somebody? You know, when you're trying to wrangle everybody in. God doesn't lose us. We don't, we don't get away from God. As the good shepherd, he leaves the 99 to seek the one. That, uh, that he is God. And, and we as his people, as baptized children of God, he keeps us. We, we are kept. We are in his care. Uh, and we don't have to fear um, uh, to, to be forsaken by God. Because Jesus was forsaken for us, right? So that's uh, uh, just beautiful words of comfort that, that we want to return to uh, on the, the, the times that we, are, uh, that we are fearful and we are doubting and we are questioning, you know, does God still love me? Uh, are these different things? Yes, in John 6 it tells me that God, that Jesus will lose nothing that has been given to him. And you as his children have been given to the good shepherd. So we want to... Uh, want to, to comfort our conscience. All right, so uh, continuing back to, to, to Ephesians 5 and 6. It talks about um, it is the good pleasure of the Father's will for us. It echoes uh, Christ's baptism, right? The beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We have the same root word in Greek. Um, and uh, think of today. What is today? Transfiguration Sunday. Um, uh, I don't remember if I read that, but did it call him his beloved? I think it called him his chosen one in Luke. Uh, but in the other accounts, it, it speaks also of Jesus being the beloved son. This connection back to Jesus' baptism, where he purifies the water for our baptism. That we are to share in, the, in, in being beloved uh, by God. That it is his good pleasure. Uh, that, uh, how does he say it? It's a good pleasure of his will. Uh, that we should be called uh, sons of God. All right, uh, in verse 6, we talk about uh, the praise of the glory of his grace, uh, by which he has made us accepted in the beloved. Once again, uh, Jesus being called uh, beloved by the Father. So God's glory in most of the Old Testament referred to his presence on earth. Uh, turn to Exodus 40, the very beginning of your Bible. 40:34. So we have uh, in Exodus, just as a, as a quick refresher, when the, when the Israelites are wandering in the desert, God is with them. How does he lead them? It says in there, during the day he leads them by... Okay. Son, you're in here, yes. A cloud at night. Pillar of fire, right? So God, to, to show the Israelites that he is with them. He is the one that has delivered them. Um, but, but God has uh, no temple, no, no permanent residency yet with the Israelites. That will come when Solomon builds the temple. We'll have another account where God's glory comes into the temple. But this temporary habitation of the Lord is the tabernacle, this tent. It's like a, a tent version of the temple, if, if you will. Um, but in 4034, then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So we have the glory of the Lord associated with the presence of God on earth. So with that in the back of our brain, um, we, we have here that it talks about in verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which he has made us accepted in the Beloved that we have the glory of the Lord now in God-made man, 
that, that once again, going back to John, that it continues to speak of the glory uh, of God through Christ. That we have uh, the presence of God in the glory of the Son. That we share in that presence. Uh, we have, you know, we have the, the, once again, the transfiguration today. We have the, glory, the glorified body of Christ on that mountain and, and God's disciples in his presence. And we still share in that today. We'll share in that at the altar where God comes to us in body and blood for the forgiveness of our sins. That the, that the glory of the Lord is, is present with us still. He has not removed his glory uh, from us. So uh, I have the connection there to uh, uh, the duality of God's glory. Uh, he can come to judge and destroy his enemies. Uh, or he can come to save his people. So Paul uh, speaks... Uh, he, he adds a, an adjective to this glory to tell us what kind of glory he's coming in. Because Once again, it could be fearful to be in the glory of God, in the, holy, uh, in the presence of holy God, um, if we remained in our sins. But we don't remain in our sins because we are forgiven uh, in our baptism. That Paul speaks of the gracious glory uh, of God, of his coming to save his people. Um, and uh, so God's grace is a theme that Paul will circle back on uh, in Ephesians 2.8, where he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. That, um, that it is God's grace. This is kind of one of our, you know, our memory verses as Lutherans. Um, and, and Luther most certainly loved this passage. By grace you have been saved, saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. So what can you do in your salvation, according to Ephesians 2.8? Nothing. It is a gift. It is God's grace, giving that which you don't deserve. He gives it to you because he loves you. You are his child. It is a gift of God. All right, so as Christians, we are in Christ and experience the very love that God has shown, uh, shown his son from all eternity. So uh, turn with me, this, this might be the last one we have, Romans 8, 39. Beautiful gospel here in Romans 8. <clears throat> I'll start with 38. For I am persuaded, this is Paul speaking, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That, that once again, beautiful words of gospel that nothing can separate us from his love. In Christ, that, that something really happens at the baptismal font, something really happens when you are declared righteous, something really happens when you are given faith, that, that you, are, you cannot be separated from God's love. That this is uh, just, like I said, beautiful words that we are to, to constantly keep on our lips because it's, it's a, a world out there that, it's attacking our faith. It attacks our, our Christianity. It makes us, uh, the devil just wishes for us to doubt. That's all his, his goal is not to get you to recant necessarily, but to get you to doubt. He just wants you to doubt. You know, were those words really for me? Is God really saying that about me? And the, and the devil will throw your sins right back in your face and, and say that obviously they can't be for you because you're still sinning. And, and, but we know, uh, as Christians, that we, we live uh, as, as saints and as sinners. This is the life that we live daily, that we, uh, that we need forgiveness. And, and guess what? God continues to give it to us, overflowing. That's what he'll, he'll talk about uh, uh, in verse uh, 8, which he pours out upon us. God's grace is overflowing toward us. His forgiveness is, is, uh, washes over our sins in abundance. That it is, uh, uh, there, there is no uh, limit 
uh, to the forgiveness found in Christ. Um, but the devil wants you to think, you know, no, that was the last one. That was the last time God, God will forgive you. Um, you know, kind of like a, you know, a bank account or something. Like, nope, insufficient funds. Sorry, you're stuck in that one. No, that, it, that, that the Bible consistently speaks of the, the abundance uh, of God's love for us, which is rooted in Christ's forgiveness for us. Uh, so we don't want to, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't let the devil have his way, because we know the devil's a liar, right? He can't be trusted. You know, but I'm guilty of hearing that and believing what he says. You know, it's something that we all struggle with. But, but, uh, but we take verses like 839 and we, and we put those right back in, in front of the devil because the devil can't be where God's word is. He flees from truth because uh, he's a scoundrel. And, and we, we keep these words on our heart uh, for those moments that we are weak and we, and we feel uh, uh, susceptible to, to his attacks. <clears throat> All right. Let's see, Paul speaks of the baptismal blessings and baptized life that we now live in Christ uh, in his letter to the Colossians. Uh, so this is after Ephesians, Colossians is um, right after Philippians, and this will be the last uh, little passage that we talk of here. 312, Colossians is written by Paul, same author, uh, or I should say same pen, it is most certainly the same author, the Holy Spirit, God himself. Uh, but the same pen, Paul, writing to the, the, the church at uh, Colossia, says in 3.12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another the forgiveness, uh, forgiving one another, if anyone has a complaint against another, even as Christ forgave you, you also must do. That Paul is now putting this, this forgiveness that we have in Christ uh, this is how we live this as baptized uh, believers. And, and think of the Lord's Prayer. Uh, it's right there. And when Christ teaches us how to pray, we, we ask for forgiveness of our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. There is, a, there is a reality. This isn't just theoretical theology and theoretical uh, baptismal doctrine. There's a, it's reality to us. It's how we interact with one another in the church and with those out, uh, outside of the church as well. Uh, that we, um, uh, we, are, we are to forgive because we are forgiven. All right, so questions or comments before we close for today? There's got to be something. I haven't effectively done my job if you aren't thinking of anything. You're like, what? I don't, I don't quite get that. Nothing? I'm sorry. Forgiving of other doctrine. Forgiving of other doctrine. You're supposed to exhort people if they sin. Mm-hmm. And they may be deceived of different doctrines than you. Yeah. So how do you, if you're supposed to be forgiving, sometimes it's hard, sometimes you maybe get upset when I have to say I'm sorry. Yeah. I most certainly get a little fired up about yeah. false doctrine. Yeah. You know? Uh, I think uh, Paul and Paul got fired up about false doctrine. Jesus got fired up about false doctrine. Um, I think there's, a, as Christians, we are to not tolerate false doctrine. Uh, that it is like a, a cancer that can come into a come into a church. Uh, false doctrine, and just like a, um, you know, a doctor goes in and uses uh, a scalpel to remove this cancer, we have God's word. To, to, to cut and, and remove false doctrine, that we aren't to tolerate false doctrine. But forgiveness isn't about tolerance, right? Uh, forgiveness is about, um, uh, in, in a sense, uh, repentance of those people who are in their, in their false doctrine, showing them the truth uh, that, that we must can always be ready, right? Paul tells us to always be ready to give a defense for our faith. We need to know what we believe uh, so we can tell them where they're wrong. Uh, there's, there, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, because that is loving to those people. To, to allow somebody to remain in, in their, you know, in, in, a, in a heretical belief is to be completely unloving. 
saying, you know, sorry. Wish I, you know, glad I'm not you. No, we want to tell them what the truth is. And how is that almost always met? They don't want to hear it, or you don't have it right, or that might, that might be true to you, but this is true to me. So we pray for those people, you know, and we, we, we pray that, that uh, the Holy Spirit uh, would, would uh, act in their lives and that they would repent of their false belief. So I, uh, I think that we are to consistently declare the truth uh, to them, that uh, forgiveness is not a, that's all right, buddy, you know, we'll, you know, we'll, 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 we'll get her next time. You know, no, we, we, stand, we stand firm in the faith, uh, but, we, but we, we always declare that truth to them. So, um, yeah, that answer, in a way, it's tough. It's tough to live that out. You know, I mean, uh, we all have members of our family who, who might be in a false belief of some, some way or the other, whether it be a, a church or theology or a rejection of all truth and, and belief. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A lot more liberal yeah. out there, I would say, but I have co-workers and I get into conversation a lot, and I found that I can talk to them, but one of the best ways is witnessing. Mm-hmm. So talking to them about my beliefs, but, you know, I will have that conversation, but then if I go and start gossiping with them, or they see that I don't live out what I'm, mm-hmm. you know, what I'm in the world, you know, but we're not to be of the world. We are, we are distinct in, in, in how we act, although there are people that live a fairly moral life, but they can, ha- they can reject uh, God and, you know, uh, and Christ. Uh, but yeah, most certainly, uh, we're not to be hypocrites to, uh, to our culture, and, and that's, that's one of the, the common labels that they give us. Oh, he's just a He's just a hypocrite, you know. They, they, you don't want to. You don't want to uh, basically lose uh, reputation in the sense of uh, through your licentious living, through your sinful, just you know, uh, living a, a life of of complete and utter sin that that takes away from your reputation to now declare the truth and say, you know, you don't even believe that yourself by how you're acting. Most certainly. Uh, but ultimately, those people are going to be brought to faith through God's word, the Holy Spirit. Faith comes through hearing. So we need to be ready to, to give that defense. All right. No more questions. We'll close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful for this time to come and study your word. Uh, be with us uh, as we enter into uh, the divine service. We thank you for the, the word and sacrament that you bless us with. Uh, be with us uh, today as we go out and we are witnesses in this world uh, that, that we may be lights in a, in a sin-darkened world. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for our sins. We thank you for the baptisms that we have in Christ, that we are now your children. Amen.